Hey, welcome back to Deck Badger Radio. Uh, we're going to chat with Bruce separately. He's a friend of the show, as we like to say around here. And uh, Bruce is a uh, creative thing. Hey, Bruce, Doug Padgett and John Patrick. Doug hey, Doug, how you doing? Hi, John. Great. Hello. Hey, glad to have Hi. you. Glad to have you on. Sorry about that hour confusion. I know there was a little aha moment for you. Well, I just was not thinking of the central time zone. Of time, so. <laughs> That's right. See, it's just a good reminder that we all live within the social construct of time. No. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Uh, hey, this is Bruce Epperly. Bruce does a number of things in his life, uh, is, is an author and as a thinker. And Bruce, I love having you on the show because I, I like the way you talk about and think about not only uh, religion, but God, um, because it sounds a lot like the way I like to talk about it. So I like having you on the show. Uh, and you have a... Uh, I like having you on this <laughs> show because you're a lot like me. Because when, you st- when I stop talking, you say things that I like. Um, not that our other guests don't, don't as well, um, but, but Bruce does a number of things and has, has written a new book. And Bruce, I, I don't have the name of the book right in front of me. Well, you know, the last one out on in the world was uh, Emerging Process. Emerging Process. Process Thought and uh, uh, Emerging Christianity. And it came out maybe four or five months ago. That's the one uh, I was thinking. I'm always percolating of. something, just like you. We're we're both inventive guys. Yes, I was going to say I, I had mentioned to John Patrick, the the sidekick here, that you. Um, I said uh, Bruce writes a book a month, like I do. <laughs> and uh, we, we do our best to to keep adding new ideas to the world of theology. That, that's so. right. You do what you, and someday people are really going to catch on to us, and they're going to. Look, you guys are just shining so like much it. sunshine up your own ass yeah. right now. <laughs> it's, we're sort of the energy <laughs> drink of theology. Oh, I will tell you. Uh, hey, so, so Bruce, t- t- tell us what uh, for, for those who don't know what 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 the, what the notion of of um, process theology is um, uh, or, or at least the, the ideas and the concepts of how one thinks about God and that you chase out in your in your two uh, now now four month old uh, in your four month old book um, give us the give us the quick rundown of how you think about God and faith and religion and so on in the world well I, I believe that uh, we live in a, in a world in which things are constantly changing evolving moving together in a interdependent way, mm-hmm. sometimes converging in positive ways, sometimes negative ways. Mm-hmm. And like yourself, I see God's presence as providing innovation and inspiration and challenge and not being the sole determiner of events or the decision maker or the decider, but the one who works within every moment of life to help us bring forth beauty and goodness, reconciliation, uh, I think that when we look at God, especially in this current uh, political and social context, the the God I see in process thought actually delights in diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, God doesn't want a uniform world. Uh, God likes contrasts, even political contrasts, and uh, looks for ways to make purple out of red and, and blue. Yes. And looks for ways to help us look beyond our own individual interests to become people of stature who look to the common good. And uh, in many ways, I was just reading John Cobb's newest book, Spiritual Bankruptcy, and of course for us as process thinkers, and I know we agree on this, Doug, uh, one of the common good areas is the earth right now. Mm -hmm. How do we preserve this earth of diversity of God's creation and wonder, which is valuable to God, not just to us, and valuable in and of itself, not just to us. How do we balance that and sustain that with, with the need to have uh, economic growth that's good for everyone, not just for the 1% or for a small handful? You know, I've, I've decided I'm moving on to Mars now. Now, now that we have a, a rover there and we find out all that stuff, I'm going to not worry about the Earth anymore because we're totally underwater. Well, I, here, I know so you just, like to rove around a I, bit. I'm just, I'm just mo- moving my attention to, well, let's let's think about <laughs> Mars as well. You know, we've got, we now have a vested interest there. And, and Doug, I, I would like to, or Bruce, I'd like to um, congratulate you because um, I think it took you only like maybe 17 seconds before you just spouted off a whole bunch of heretical things. That was quite quick. <laughs> That's right. That God well, is, God know, is not they, the, they may look God is not the decider. One, yeah. From one perspective, but, you know, as I look at Christian history, and, and I, uh-huh. I'm, I don't take any any offense at your comment, by the way. As I look at Christian oh, I, history, I, I, I'm there's a whole I'm bunch of at all, so. out there, and yeah. every but virtually everybody and his mother has been excommunicated at that's one right. time or another. <laughs> so you're right. in good company. Well, and and that's the thing, Bruce, uh, that, that I appreciate that you, that you bring up, um, just just by by 
by the nature of your description of God and faith and Christianity and so on, is that it does implicate the views that people have about the stability of their own faith. Like many Christians believe that if you say something about God where God is interdependent with the rest of the world, that with, with the rest of creation, that God is, is not deciding but is an actor inside of, in, inside of the world, that God doesn't demand but woos and creates and remakes and partners with people and all of creation as part of the process of recreation. Though that kind of language sounds so different from what people have been taught in their Christianity, that it does bring up this sense where people are like, but that's got to be wrong because that's not what the tribe that I've come from has said. And at one point that could just be, well, those, those you know, old middle-aged guys, they're just a bunch of, you know, heretical liberals. Or it could also make someone say, hey, maybe the version of Christianity that I've been told that I thought everyone for all time in all places always believed Maybe I've just been believing a particular version of this, and I don't have to be bound to it any longer. There are a lot of windows in the world of faith, and at least for me, uh, I take Jesus pretty seriously on this point. Uh, you know, when Jesus used the Pareto metaphor to describe God, you had to ask what kind of parent he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, was he talking about a, a unilateral decision maker who made all the choices? and left nothing to us, right. that certainly wasn't the way Jesus was acting. And I, I'm a biblical Christian, and I take some of Jesus, uh, uh, many of his passages to, as admonitions to us. Remember that passage from John when Jesus says, and you can do greater things. Yes. And, and Jesus is not competing with us. Uh, Jesus That's is, right. <laughs> sees God and himself as a good parent who wants the child to be creative, mm -hmm. to be free within the boundaries of what's healthy for the environment and, and the child her, her, or, or her himself, and wants that freedom to be good for everyone. Um, I mean, a good parent uh, doesn't keep you in the playpen all your life. Mm -hmm. well, okay, and so, a good so, God, I think, invites us to adventure, be creative, and God's willing to take the risk of feeling the tragedy of the world in the quest for beauty and wonder. That's right, and and I, I certainly feel that, and and but but I do wonder, like we live in this age, you know, that's made up of gastro pubs and cloud computing, and um, you know, people sexting each other and all this kind of thing, and there's people who are like, look, we just can't trust ourselves. Like, um, I have a friend who's a, who's a a quite emerging progressive type, and she's a Lutheran, and she will like to say, oh, you people that you know think that people are good, you're so cute and quaint. Like, and so there's kind of this notion in society that really people, people suck and people are kind of asses and we need God to not play by our rules, right? There's that impulse that people have. Do you sure. think that that impulse hasn't been talked about well enough within uh, the categories of, of, of religion and God and Christianity and process thought that, that, that we're talking about? Like, do you think there's some big glaring problems that um, aren't being addressed at sort of a popular level enough for people to say, well, like, I oh, I got you. I think so, and I think, and I, I want to be clear that, that I, I don't see the, the world or, or the human situation as, as unambiguously good. We make right. a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, uh -huh. We only need to, to see what's going on in Syria or Aurora, Colorado, to know that uh, there is a, a movement toward entropy and, and uh, tragedy in the world that, that in many ways is part of the situation. But right. I don't think it's, I don't believe it is inherent in what it means to be a human. I think, oh, that, uh, yeah. I, I think that probably sin is more of a social disease than a uh, disease of the human nature itself. Right. That is, we are the imperfect children of imperfect parents in an imperfect society. And I think that that's obvious to us. Mm -hmm. I think within that, there's a movement toward goodness and beauty, the, a movement toward reconciliation, the, the movement in ourselves that helps us uh, have a wound that heals, the, yeah. the movement in our hearts that helps us love again, uh, the movement that helps us face what we can't change with courage. Uh, so we are ambiguous creatures, but... I don't think I need somebody on the outside, uh, an external yeah. force, uh, 
to lay down the law, I think that I am more likely to do the good because somebody loves me enough to push me forward. Yeah. And uh, again, I see it as a grandparent now of two young children that mm -hmm. uh, this is, you see them grow and you see the impact <laughs> of of care and love and listening and mirroring and, and correcting. Yeah, uh, so, may, so maybe what that's kind it. Of people they're becoming. Maybe we shouldn't think about God in the parent. Maybe we should think about God in the grandparent role because anybody who's parented sort of has that feeling like maybe you don't always like your kids, but grandparents yep. tend to. <laughs> so, so maybe the problem isn't that you know we think about God as you know father or mother. Maybe we need to be thinking about grandfather or grandmother, and that would help. Uh, maybe maybe that would help all of us. Well, well that would be very much in the na in the spirit of the native peoples, wouldn't it? Uh, oh, the United interesting. States, the yeah. and the grandparents. And, and the truth be told, uh, with that, without me stretching the metaphor too much and, and patting we grandparents on the, the back, there is a certain sense in which the grandparent is more able to be a non-anxious presence than the parent. Uh-huh. Especially yeah. of a first child, because we've been through it. We Our children survived us right. somehow or other. Uh, right. We're not as nervous Right. And you're just uh, and a little more beaten to down. Be said for yeah. having survived it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. You just you, you you got all the angst beaten out of you during the course of that. Well, one of the conversations we've had before, personally, and I know we've maybe even had it on the radio show, is, um, like this stuff really uh, it it captivates my mind, my imagination, my soul. I get it. I like it. That that's the way I've thought about Christianity from the beginning. That it was an invitation of God to participate in what God was about in the world, and that. Um, uh, the the Christian narrative for me grabs me g grabbed me and pulled me into this ongoing life of God that that um, fulfilled my humanity in a way that the other narratives in life didn't. But I'll tell you, most people don't want to go to churches or read books or access their their Christianity through those lenses. What is it that makes the kinds of ideas that that, that that you're that you're talking about and that I want to talk about um, less appealing than the um, some version of sinners in the hand of an angry God where grace is shown that God's not going to smite you the way that God truly wants to. Like, why do those churches and those books and those views of Christianity seem to thrive and um the stuff that we're talking about, people seem to hear it and be like, oh, that's all that's all wishy washy, softy, softy stuff. Yeah, well, that's that's a very good question, and I think part of it, part of it, and I'm not, I, I think that where you are, Doug, at Solomon's Porch, there's a lot of life and vitality, and there's a health and wellness ministry, and, mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of the progressive tradition is still operating just out of the head, and a lot of the progressive tradition, and that's where process thought has made its greatest impact uh -huh. in the liberal tradition. Like in the thinking, you mean, that people are doing with about thinking. About what it uh -huh. doesn't believe. And for all oh. of the progressive, uh, for all of the progressive uh, intellectualism, uh, progressives are, and liberals are not always astute scripturally or theologically as they ought to be. Hmm. Now, I happen to think that a good, a good faith tradition, and I... I've uh, been part of growing congregations, and yeah. I believe this this process thought, progressive thought, has power and life to it. Yep. People need to address the Bible, warts and all. Yep. They need to teach spiritual practices and teach people how to meditate and pray. They need to to uh, make peace with the what make peace with extraordinary moments of energy, mystical or healing energy, mm -hmm. uh, that, the, you know, quite often, again, the liberal tradition has been known by being much too horizontal uh, mm -hmm. in some ways, uh -huh. and I, I'm not one, not, an, uh, not one who thinks we ought to have a vertical approach to theology, but place for wonder and, and yes. for healing and for acts of God that are still naturalistic, don't violate the the probable laws of nature, but but can take quantum leaps in which cells are changed as well as souls. And I think sometimes we we don't put our mission mm -hmm. uh, strong mm -hmm. enough in saying that we have something really important to say. And uh, some I, uh, there's a there's sort of a, a, a humorous joke uh, from uh, that came out of real life of one of my progressive friends. The strongest assertion he'd ever make in a sermon was. 
it seems to me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, 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 that was now, extremism. that's a heck of a far cry from thus saith the Lord, and you better be careful if you say thus saith the Lord. Yeah. But it seems to me really does fall into the category of wishy-washy. Yeah. Uh, I'd rather at least to say I believe. Yes. Help down my unbelief. I believe that that God is present in the world and moving to us toward greatness and reconciliation and learning from other faith traditions. And uh-huh. I believe in the power of prayer, but I don't have to be, have a comb over to be a healer. Uh, uh-huh. I believe in uh, <laughs> the healing touch, but it doesn't have to be like the folks on TV. It could be the healing touch that happens much more subtly. So mm-hmm. uh, I think, again, a, a good faith is very much embracing around the center of a lively lively experience of God, a lively intellect, and that, that translates itself into actions that uh, save the earth and save the peoples of the earth. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. I know that you're a practitioner of a, of a, of a healing art called Reiki. And, I sure am. And there are people for whom, um, like, they're willing to do a little massage, they're willing to go to a yoga class, they're willing to do um, some acupuncture, but that crazy ass Reiki stuff, like that, is out of, like that's 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 full on, you know, new agey gobbledygook kinds of stuff. So, as a as a um, as my only personal friend who's a practitioner of Reiki, uh, tell us what that's all about. What how does the, well? I'd be what, delighted. What is it? And, and let me give you a little shameless commerce. Since Please. I know you're not uh, above or beneath that. Doug. No, I I'm right. <laughs> really, Doug Touch. Badger Radio. I think uh, I think I'm pretty clearly in the uh... Reiki Healing Touch in the Way of Jesus. Uh huh. Is a book I wrote several years ago with my wife, and I wrote it for the for the same reason as that you asked there. Yeah. I, I had been teaching a course at Wesley Seminary, where I've been on the faculty as an adjunct for more years than I can remember, <laughs> on uh, new spiritual We're movements. John and I discovered that almost everyone in the class had, a, had, had an experience with some form of holistic medicine or alternative yeah. spirituality. None of them could talk to their pastor about it. Right. They felt embarrassed. Right. And these were liberal churches. Or their doctor so, about it, right. So I, you know, certainly not their doctors. Half the people who do alternative care things don't talk to their doctors mm-hmm. about it, which occasionally leads to some problems. But I, but I was convicted, and, and as they say in evangelical circles, that I needed to write a book that expressed my faith that God was at work in the movements of healing touch, whether they originated in Christianity or Judaism or Chinese, Japanese medicine, uh-huh. and that wherever healing is present, God is its source. And actually, just the other day, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, Doug, I've uh, moved back down to D.C. to be closer to my grandchildren. I heard that, yes. Uh, although I'm heading out to teach at Claremont next week for the fall, but uh, and be bi-coastal. But oh, I just bi. taught mm-hmm. a couple people Reiki in the pastor's study the other day. I'm an interim sub- summer pastor at a church in Virginia, and they were eager to learn it, and I've uh, found that when people are given a rational version, uh, an understanding of some of these healing arts. They don't see them as so woo-woo or new age. They say, oh yeah, I've experienced energy. And frankly, I think the the progressives and liberals, my Uh people, the moderates, my people, the emerging people, my people, need to open to wherever God's healing. So what is Reiki? How does it it work? I know it's energy work. Okay. Uh, How it works is basically, I call it prayer with your hands. So... It involves, for someone like me, so having to receive some attunements which strengthen the energy you have. Oh, that's awesome. But hang on, what's an attunement? Like hang, hang on a second. Hang on a second. What's, while I'm touching you. What, uh, is an attu- in, what, what is an attunement? An attunement involves a person who wants to become a practitioner basically uh-huh. going through an uh, a, so almost like a sitting meditation in which a teacher uh-huh. like myself would would use some symbols to strengthen the energy flow. I see it very similar to use the symbols that a priest uses that, uh, or a minister uses at communion. You know, words and symbols seem to have a vibratory power. And I can't honestly tell you, Doug, how this works, and I'm a pretty yeah. rational guy. But virtually everyone that, I, I guess I could say everyone that I've been involved in teaching Reiki has had some sort of health, healing, or spiritual experience and a sense of greater energy as a result of it. So, so you're and saying that, that, every person, pers- that every person has energy in their body and attunement allows someone to pay attention to or to harness or to become more 
Um, it turns on. It opens the. It opens the hose a little wider. What I like about Reiki is you oh, don't have to get yourself in an alpha state to do it. Uh, once you've been attuned, you just simply, uh, whenever you think of the Reiki process itself, uh, your most people's hands begin to get warm and they have a perceptible change in their connectedness with, with others. Now, this isn't magic. I think it's part of what the Chinese folks have called qi or qi uh -huh. over the years. I don't think it's much different from that power that flowed through Jesus. I was going to ask you that. Uh, so do you see like the Jesus narrative where the woman, you know, there's, there's a story where the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years reaches out and grabs the hem of Jesus and feels yeah. a healing at that moment. Do you, I mean, is, is your sense that, that there was something in Jesus and the, and the followers of Jesus to perform healing that was the part of this energy flow being harnessed from I them think in a particular so, and it way? could very well have been the energy of the Big Bang. I just finished a book, actually, on healings in Mark's Gospel. It's going to come out later this year. It's a sequel to a book I wrote years ago called God's Touch, but uh, on the healings of Jesus. I'm convinced that it makes a difference. Now, it's not magic. There's no guarantee. So you're saying you're whatever force up. it was that created all that, uh, however, the, the universe sort of opened uh, in, in explosion, you know, from the Big Bang, because John Patrick, that of course, has a smirk on his on. face here about that. And I, don't, I, I wanted to sort of, uh, sort of put it in the context of saying, don't, look, don't necessarily look at Benny Hinn to understand this. Uh -huh. Look at the way a child changes when you hold them in a loving way. Ah. Look but do you think Benny Hinn is doing that? Like, like, do you think those faith healers really have? I mean, is is it? it do you, Do you think some of that f that faith healing stuff is legitimate? Uh, oh, I believe that. I, I I trust the good faith of some of them. Uh, I which think ones? The challenge for them, especially the television healers, and this is where it becomes problematic. I see. Yeah. Is that when they go on TV, they have to be successful a hundred percent of the time. Great. Right. 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 Unlike, unlike radio, it, where yeah. you can just. I I've lived with prayer all my life, and I've had I have no idea how huh. prayer is answered, when's it answered, and ways that are answered. But I still keep praying. And I certainly know that uh, I, I, they've not, not yet, yet done any statistical studies, but some people have done anecdotal studies sure. of, of these folks, and maybe 10% of the people experience some improvement. Right. You know, I like, but I when like people the... start jumping out of wheelchairs and uh, yeah. uh, immediately are throwing off their glasses or hearing aids, although I wouldn't want to be in the car with one of those who'd thrown off his glasses necessarily, <laughs> uh, you know, that sort of does a disservice because it assumes that cause and effect happen in a linear way and immediately. It assumes that, uh, that, that when you don't get well, there's something right. wrong with your faith or your church's faith, right. or God doesn't want you to get well. Right. I always thought there's something And I think wrong with God it. wants us all yeah. to have abundant life, and God works through the cause and effect relationships mm -hmm. and our faith and our community's faith to bring about health outcomes that are better than worse. I think, Doug, you write about that in one of your books, as I recall, in relationship to your wife. That's and, why uh, I like having you on this show. You know, that, yeah, I think, what, yes. is Christianity worth believing or Thank something you, like that? Thank you, available at your fine book retailers. Yes, and at DougPadgett.com. Yeah, fine book. But you know how it blows your mind Right. The people get well. Yeah. They don't have to go to Benny Hill. I mean, I'll tell you, like, like right now, I've got a, I've got a, a, an acupuncture thing in my ear right now. This thing I'm going to wear for five days, and I got acupuncture yesterday in my ear and other places in my body, and it's made my right foot feel better. Where I had a ten day uh, hobbling pain, and um, and you're suggesting that that um, Reiki is one of the ways in which someone in, is part of the interplay with you in that in that way. Oh. Without a doubt, doubt and, and, and you know, a great, a great combination, frankly, is Reiki and acupuncture, and, 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 and they are, frankly, related to one another. They, they involve that sense of energy and flow and keeping it moving, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the, and both of these are being studied in, in the mm. NIH, you know, the results yeah. are still open, but the studies of acupuncture and Reiki have revealed at least one thing clearly, that people who receive acupuncture and Reiki at the very least 
experience greater peace of mind and huh. stress reduction, overall sense of wellness. And that's pretty good regardless of what else you're looking for. Great. Well, that's, that's Bruce separately. Bruce, thanks so much for, uh, for your friendship, for being on the show and, uh, and for chatting with us. And you can pick up where, where, where could, where could people find the, the list of your many works if they wanted oh, to? Oh, I think you could find them on Amazon would be the best place or my website, which is Bruce Epperly.com. Bruce Epperly.com. Fantastic. Hey, Bruce, I look forward to our paths crossing soon. Yeah, look forward to coming on again. Talk All right, buddy. to you later. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, thanks, folks. Uh, Doug Padgett Radio. We will uh, be back with you next week. 10 to 11.30 a.m. Doug Padger Radio, live out of the Twin Cities on DougPadgerRadio.com, Blog Talk Radio, and, of course, Ustream. You can pick up all the back stories. <laughs> John Patrick, Doug Padgett, signing off. Talk to you next week.